Hey guys, Richter Oldner here and welcome to the channel. You know what every supercharged 3800 V6 from the junkyard really needs? No, it doesn't need more boost. No, it doesn't need ported heads. No, it doesn't need a camshaft. Well, yes, it needs all of those things, but what it really needs is an intercooler. In this video, I'm going to show you what happened when we installed a ZZP air to water intercooler on our supercharged 3800 L67 V6. Yes, I know that's a mouthful. I'm going to show you what happened to power. I'm going to show you what happened to the charge temperature and I'm going to show you what happened to the repeatability because that's very important. As we saw before, the supercharged motor run, 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 run. Lots and lots and lots of hot. We don't want that. That's why we have an interview. Okay guys, to compare the non-intercooled versus the intercooled version, our air to water intercooler upgrade from the guys at ZZ Performance. Let's take a look at what our motor did running non-intercooled. We made just over 400 horsepower and 384 foot-pounds of torque. The motor was configured, it was an L67 3800 Series 2 V6. It had the L32 heads on it though, which I don't think are a big difference. We did have a valve spring upgrade, but otherwise they were stock. We had the comp cam in there, 510 lift, 210 to 20 degree duration split at 50 and 115 degree load separation angle. We had the Gen 5 blower on there with a three inch blower pulley on it and the factory throttle body and stuff. We ran this thing non-intercooled. We'll get into the charge temperatures and stuff, but run in that manner. Oh yeah, we also had the long tube or tubular headers on this combination. We ran this thing on E85 and it made 400 horsepower and 384 foot-pounds of torque in non-intercooled form. And this is at about 12 pounds of boost out at the peak. Here's what happened after we added our ZZP air to water intercooler. You can see we got a dramatic increase in power. We made 414 horsepower. Peak torque was up to 404 foot-pounds, but I know everybody is gonna be looking at this little dip right here that happened at 4,900 RPM. Now I tried everything. I tried more fuel, I tried less fuel, I tried more timing, I tried less timing. I'm not sure what was going on here, but it seemed to be fairly consistent. We can see a little bit of a dip before we put the intercooler in. We see a dip like this on the NA version. We see a dip like this on most of the supercharged runs. It was more pronounced when we had the intercooler on there, but this was odd. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what was going on. We had E85, there's no detonation. Uh, both of these ran the same timing curves. <clears throat> we ran a peak timing out at the power peak of about 23 degrees and down at the bottom here below 3,500, it was more like 17 degrees. We tried a little bit more timing with the intercooler, but it didn't seem to respond. So I think we were already kind of at the limit of the, what timing this motor wanted run with the E85. But you can see we saw consistent gains in power through the whole RPM range. Power went up from 400 to 414 and from 384 foot pounds to 404 foot pounds. Good gains with the intercooler, but let's take a look and see what happened with both the charge temperature and the repeatability. Before we jump into the discussion on charge temperatures, I just want to show you that indeed we had the same basic air fuel curve on these, both uh, intercooled and non-intercooled. This is our non-intercooled version. You can see we started out above 12.3 uh, to 1. It went down to as rich as 11.95, so right at about 12. It was right at, right at 12 to 1 for most of the runs, or for most of the RPM range. Here's what happened with the intercooler. Same kind of thing, 12.1 uh, at the load in, and hovered around 12 to 1, got as lean. In this little dip where we saw before, um, maybe it was a misfire or something. 
Uh, at 5,000 RPM, we had 11.95. Again, to right at right at about 12 to 1 through the whole curve. So the air fuel curve was consistent, and so was the timing on both of these runs. So now let's take a look at the charge temperatures. Okay, guys, we've got a lot of cool discussion here on the charge temperatures. Obviously, that's what we're really concerned with putting an intercooler on. We know from past testing with this root supercharger that it's not terribly efficient. And not only that, it tends to... Um, get hotter and hotter the more that you run it. So what we see here is, this was the run that we have that we showed the power output that we already made 400 horsepower. The charge temperature actually started at 154 degrees down here at 3300 and rose to a peak of 211 degrees out here at 6300. This is, it's important to note that this was made after a couple of successive runs. Um, this was the run that turned out to be the best in terms of power, but we did have very high charge temperatures. And the more that we run this, I'm going to go ahead and show you that. We take a look here. Here's what happened if we run when we ran basically consecutive runs here. We can look at the charge temperature and see the charge temperature also varied pretty dramatically here on some of these runs. You can see... So we see a big change. We're starting out at 154. Uh, up here on this one, we started over 170 degrees. And you can see we're finishing off above 210 degrees. This one was 214, and we hadn't even run it all the way out. So that's the other thing about the motor being non-intercooled, is that not only are we getting uh, fairly high charge temperatures, especially at the end, we're getting a, a variety of different start temperatures depending on how many runs we've made in a row or how often you're out there basically on the throttle. So when you're doing that, the non-intercooled version really isn't very repeatable. So let's get rid of a bunch of these extra runs here. And we'll compare that to the intercooled run, which we'll see is very, very good. And you can see here, <laughs> big change. We're starting out at less than 100 degrees, more like 90 degrees, and it rose to a peak of... 111 or 112. So we're looking at about a change of 100 degrees in charge temperature from the intercooled to the non-intercooled version. And this is at 12 pounds of boost with the three inch blower pulley on there and the headers and the camshaft because the camshaft also brought the boost down. But you can see the other nice thing is I showed you on the non-intercooled version, it was not very repeatable. It varied all over the place. And the more that we ran it, basically the hotter it got. By contrast, take a look at what happened when we ran successive runs with the intercooler. So these are all successive runs. That's 15, that's 16, that's 17. These are all successive runs with the intercooler. And as you can see, they're kind of overlays in terms of the charge temperature. That means that when you run the intercooler, the thing is very repeatable, which is very good when we're doing dyno testing, but even more important when you're out on the street. So that means when you nail the throttle and you run through the gears and you're having fun, and then you go to do it again, the thing's gonna be ready. And also, it's only gonna rise in charge temperature back up to the same point each time. So it's gonna start at the same point and end at the same point. That means you're gonna basically be getting not only the same performance every time, but you're also going to be getting, you're not have to worry about like detonation. So the intercooling will keep the detonation at bay, not just for one pass like we, we've seen sometimes with the non-intercooled version, but it will do it again and again and again. So it will continue to be safe, which is even more important when you're out on the road. Let's get to our conclusion. Okay guys, what did we learn from this little adventure adding the ZZP air to water intercooler on our supercharged 3800 V6 motor? Well, we learned a couple of things. First of all, intercooling definitely works. That's why I always recommend it. I try to use it whenever I can, no matter what I'm running here at West Tech, if I'm running a turbo or a blower or whatever it is, I try to run intercooling with it. Sometimes it's harder to package than others, but on this supercharged 3800 V6, the ZZP kit bolted right on and it worked out very well. We were able to run ambient dyno water through the core, which is very good. It, we showed a lot of charge cooling, but the thing that really amazed me about this is the repeatability. That was awesome. I mean, we saw when we were taking a look at the dyno results that when we run the intercooler, run after run after run, when it's non-intercooled, the temperature just keeps going up and up and up, which means we get closer and closer to detonation. Also, we're probably not making as much power, but once we added the intercooler, that totally changed. Every run just repeated. Same charge temperature, same safety margin, and we added more power. And the interesting thing about that is that we added the air to water intercooler. It did pick up the power. We went from about 400 horsepower to nearly 415 horsepower. But when we did the same test with water methanol, 
We lowered the charge temperature about the same amount, but we easily knocked 100 degrees out of it. But the thing is, we didn't gain any power. So why do you think that is? Why do we gain power from the air to water intercooler, but not from the water meth injection? Good question. I'm Richard Older. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. Lots of 3800 testing coming up. We got turbos, we got more camshafts, we got port heads, we got all kinds of good stuff. Thanks for watching. See you next time.